John Boy. Yeah. Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trash, we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you from them with lessons So sit back as we groove, giving you the review So you only spend time on the docs that you need to Welcome back to another episode of Lessons from the Screen the show where we give you a review of whether or not any information you can get through any particular screen of any kind is worth your time. We waste our time so that you don't have to. You're welcome. It would normally be Trending Tuesday today, but we're going to do something a little bit differently because, well, it, tomorrow is the 4th of July. And even more so, well, not even more so, even less so, a, a sub-reason is also because all of the trending topics right now in the United States are on entertainment celebrity gossip i'm just not into that so tomorrow being the fourth of july gives us an interesting opportunity to talk about the fourth of july but we're not going to talk about it here on this show we're going to give you food for thought and hopefully you'll have a discussion about it around your dinner tables doing what you do with your family so for this episode of lessons from the screen this tuesday we will be Reading the meaning of July 4th for the Negro, a speech given by Frederick Douglass in 1852. And in it, he talks about exactly what the title suggests, what July 4th meant for the Negro, especially at the time of 1852. And I will hope that after you finish listening to it, you would take some time and think about whether or not it still means anything remotely similar. Here it is in 2018, compared to what it meant in 1852. I would also hope that you would ask yourself some of the deeper questions and have those deeper conversations about race relations in America, about our current place in America as a people, whether it's acceptable or not, irregardless and without comparison to other groups. Do we like where we are, period? If we were, if this nation was purely us, do we like where we are? So without further ado, I bring to you on this episode of Lessons from the Screen, Frederick Douglass, The Meaning of July 4th for the Negro. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too and great enough to give frame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar? and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? 
Whoso obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Whoso stolid and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak, and the lame man leapt as a heart. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with the sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were inhumane mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct. And let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes towering up to heaven were thrown down by the breath of the almighty, burying that nation in irrevocable ruin. I can today take up the plain of lament of a peeled and woe smitten people by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there that they carried us away captive, required of us a song, and they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions, whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason, most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God 
and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion. I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. But I fancy I hear some of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which, if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beast of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. It is not astonishing that while we were plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we were reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the well in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as households, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God, and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice, hard to be understood? How should I look today 
in the presence of Americans, dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom. Speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively, to do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What, am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters? Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No. I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? that they can, may, I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability, I could reach the nation's ear. I would, today, pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim to him. Your celebration is a sham your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are, to him, more bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America wins without a rival. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work to the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened. The doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. 
while drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done. Long established customs of hurtful character could formally fence themselves in and do their evil work with social impunity. Knowledge was then confined and enjoyed by the privileged few and the multitude walked on in mental darkness. But a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea, as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. The far off and almost fabulous Pacific roads of grandeur at our feet. The celestial empire, the mystery of ages, is being solved. The fiat of the Almighty, let there be light, has not yet spent its force. No abuse, no outrage, whether in taste, sport, or avarice, can now hide itself from the all-pervading light. The iron shoe and crippled foot of China must be seen in contrast with nature. Africa must rise and put on her yet unwoven garment. Ethiopia shall stretch out her hand unto Ard. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let every heart join us in saying it, God speed the year of Jubilee, the wild world o'er, when from their galling chains set free, the oppressed shall vilely bend the knee. And wear the yoke of tyranny like brutes no more. That year will come and freedom's reign to man his plundered rights again restore. God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow. In every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood. And each return for evil, good, not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end and change into faithful friend each foe. God speed the hour, the glorious hour, when none on earth shall exercise a lordly power, nor in a tyrant's presence cower, but to all manhood stature tower. By equal birth, that hour will come to each, to all, and from his prison house to thrall, go forth. Until that year, day, hour, arrive, with head and heart and hand I'll strive to break the rod and rend the jive, the spoiler of his prey deprive. So witness heaven, and never from my chosen post, whatever the peril or the cost, be driven. So what are your thoughts? Think about it. Think about the speech. Go back, listen to it. Look up the words, which will be posted on the website, as well as being able to be found on the our sponsors page, www.pactsinc.org. That's paxinc.org. Think about it. Are there any similarities between what he's saying was happening then and the feelings of people then compared to what's happening now? and the feelings that many of us have now. These are the conversations that we should be having. See, I'm not going to sit here and say you should not get together with your friends and family and, and enjoy each other and spend time with each other. But I am going to say that 
during times when we get together to enjoy each other. We should also face those hard truths about the world we live in and the society we live in and the culture we live in. And we should have conversations, realizations, and face what we have done, what we are doing, what we will do in the future. See, it's not just enough to celebrate American independence and celebrate patriotism. Sometimes being a good friend to somebody means calling them out on their bullshit. Sometimes being a good family member means knowing when it's time to say no or when it's time to say enough. Sometimes being a good follower is knowing when it's time to say I follow long enough. And we are at a junction now, especially as black, as black people. And we've always been at a junction because we've never made a decision as to which way we're going to go to change things. So we find ourselves at this juncture now. We're going along to get along and keeping our heads down is, is not going to work anymore. Have the conversations this 4th of July that we need to have on a daily basis. Start talking, start planning, start taking action. Thank you for tuning in. This has been Lessons from the Screen, and I will see you next week. Well, no, I won't. I'll see you Thursday. Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trash, we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you from them lessons So sit back as we grew, giving you the review So you only spend time on the dots that you need to once again, I want to thank you for tuning in to Lessons from the Screen. Lessons from the Screen is brought to you by Pax Inc. Through the Freedom Train Network, you can find us on www.freedomtrainradio.com or on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Stitcher. Be sure to head to one of those places and leave us a review, and then be sure to head back to the website to let us know what you think about the show and communicate with us. Also, be sure to head to www.paxinc.org and show some love and support for our sponsors. Paxinc is doing big things in the community and trying to do more, always trying to do more. So be sure to head to the website. That's www.paxinc.org. Donate, volunteer, become a member, talk about it, whatever. They can use your support. And once again, they are doing great things in the community. And as always, Lessons from the Screen has a frame of reference and perspective that is aligned with that of the black community. The things that we look at, whether it be on the Trending Tuesday or the regular Lessons from the Screen show, will always be looked at from the black perspective. So keep that in mind because we need more minds shaped into that perspective and trying to do things that we need done for ourselves. So with that in mind, again, thank you guys for listening in. Remember to tune in to the Freedom Train Radio. We have the app that's available that you can get from the website. It's in the Google Play Store. Sorry, it's not available on iTunes yet. We have the live internet radio. And we have more shows coming up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will see you guys on Thursday for the next episode of Lessons from the Screen. <laughs>